Hello and welcome to my view from the piano bench. We do this every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. here on my Joe Holtz Notes YouTube channel, along with Piano for My Friends every Thursday evening also at 7 p.m. Thank you very much to those of you who support and encourage me using the links available on the support page of my website, and you'll see the link to that page in the video description. Check out my website while you're there. And if you do look at the support options, uh, take a look at the Patreon. It's a unique take on it. And this helps me keep things going. And I appreciate it. I would like to keep uh, both of these streams going. It is becoming uh, interesting schedule-wise, but I'm also confronted with that the pandemic-related things I have not gone away and the business is so precarious and it may never stop being precarious but let's move on the topic for this discussion uh, is chords tell a story so this is one of the topics where I'm going to try to straddle the line between musicians and non-musicians and I'm really talking to non-musicians uh, hope Hopefully providing you with a little bit of, you know, color and flavor to kind of see what goes on in the process of making music. But the emphasis that I have in this may be interesting to those of you who are musicians. And maybe this may encourage you to rethink something. Who knows? But it's a window into my brain. Ooh, scary. So... What's going to happen is I'm actually going to introduce some very basic music theory without getting into the, you know, music theory speak so much. Uh, just a concept. Uh, and that concept uh, is the idea that when you have a scale, in this case, a major scale. I happen to be playing the C major scale, but I could have played it on any note. I could have played it on like a half step up C sharp. And they both sound the same. They both sound like Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do, because that's what they are. You put these notes for sounds in relationship. They become one thing, one thing that you can now build something from. It's like a set of ingredients, right? So let's go back to the C scale. You always kind of start with that on piano and use it for illustration because it's the one scale that uses all white keys and doesn't use any black keys. So from the scale, we develop chords and in this culture we all even if you're not a musician you know the word chord it's what you pick up your guitar and you play right uh, chords were not always that uh, in fact chords were not always chords uh, and the function of chords, if I'm going to use the word harmony, is to provide a foundation underneath, ultimately, I'm actually, okay, let me just say, this, say it this way and not qualify, to provide, provide a foundation underneath of a melody, that that melody supports and by bringing something out of that melody that that melody implicitly says then those chords and that harmony and what you develop from it become support for the melody in other words all i have to do is play a melody and this is going to be a simple one And every 
everything you need to know about however you're going to play that melody is contained in that melody. And it's, I was going to say a basis for improvisation, but I mean, it's, it's the playground for those of us who are improvisers. All you need is the melody. Now, but where do the chords come from? Well, the chords come from the melody. And the melody comes from the scale. So when you hear this scale, yeah, yeah, go on, come on, come on. Hey, hey, where are you going? There it is, right? You get a feeling of movement. And then the need to finish. We travel. We end. And that would be a pretty basic example of tension and release. Tension and release is absolutely everything about music making, ultimately, and life. And if you were to tell any verbal story, you would be telling a story about going along some road of some kind and then s there's some tension that needs resolving and the tension gets resolved. A silly example would be, or maybe not silly, we all experience this. We get up in the morning and the longer we wait to eat breakfast or something, you know, the, the, the more agitated we might get, right? So we're up in the morning, the longer we're up, and it's like, okay, it's 11 a.m. and you, you finally you finally eat a sandwich and you feel better, right? That's what I'm talking about. But you don't need to play a scale straight up to get that. You can get that from any combination of notes. And I'm using the notes of the major scale. I'm just rearranging them. Here, the idea of the tension and release or resolution is more subtle. And if you're not actually in the middle of making music, uh, you're not thinking about that, especially as a listener. You're just being pulled along by it, right? But when I phrase it that way, you can hear... first phrase, a little more mm, subtle in the second phrase, but you can hear there, there's movement. And everything we do in, in life and everything we do in music is propelled by what you could describe as some kind of tension, something that creates the need to move. If you just don't create any need to move, you just might not move. Right? You might not move. But if you create the need to move, you're going to move. Make sense? So, uh, the idea of a chord. And I'm going to avoid the big wonky explanation that I always want to give. And that's that chords as a concept didn't exist until a few hundred years ago. And in the big picture of history, that's a blip. Uh, the idea of like a group of notes being a thing, right? And that thing you put a label on and then, you know, it's like a rock, you know? It's a C chord. Pick it up, look at it, put it back, right? Play your guitar, you know? But, it's really a whole lot more than that. Um, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you seven chords. Seven chords that are related to the seven notes 
eight is a repeat of one, so we don't include that. The seven notes of the scale. Now, if you're a musician, you know that a major triad is one, three, five of the scale. But we can just say, play every other note. And actually, you can keep going beyond three notes. But for this, three notes, every other note. And then go to the next note of the scale. Play every other note. It's a different chord. The next note of the scale, the third note, play every other note. The fourth note, play every other note. Three notes, triads. And now we have seven different chords. Which we could extend beyond three notes, and typically do. But to keep this illustration pretty straightforward, I'm going to show you that you have seven chords. What those chords are, or at least what many of them are, are not so relevant for, for this. I mean, they're, they're relevant to this concept. They are this concept, but they're not relevant to un, have to understand right now. But I will tell you, we call them the one chord, the two chord, the three chord, the four chord, the five chord, the six chord, the seven chord, because they come from that note of the scale. But notice what I'm doing. When I play a C chord, I'm using the C scale. When I play a D chord, I'm using the C scale. Because the D scale, remember the C is the only one that only has white keys? There's the D scale. So there's the D major chord, because it comes from the major scale. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the C major chord is one, the D chord, which happens to be minor, and I'm not going to get into Many of you know the difference between major and minor chords. But the, the point here is just to understand that I'm using the kind of host scale. Now I'm on the third note, E, which happens to be minor. F happens to be major. G happens to be major. A happens to be minor. B happens to be something we call diminished, an inherently tense chord. Right? And I just kind of gave away that what we are managing with these chords is like the only thing that happens in music on 9,000 levels, tension and release, right? We have seven chords, but we're going to narrow them down to three chords. Three chords. The one, the four, you musicians knew that's where I was going. So we have, and I don't know why I picked up my pencil because I was going to write down one, four, five, but it's but it's right here. And here's the concept. And this is something that if you're a musician, it might be a different way to think about chords. It, it, it throws a conceptual uh, light on the whole thing about managing tension and release with chords. And that is, chords do one of three things. They sit there. Or they end something. Or they don't go anywhere. They're passive. They're just, hey man, here we are. Then, you start moving. So relative to this, hey, I'm sitting here, leave me alone, get off my lawn, right? And then we're moving, we're moving. Don't know where, but we're moving. Okay, we got up. And then we get to a place where, oh, oh, yeah. Can you hear that? Increasing tension, and now you gotta, you gotta bring it back down, okay? And to use the illustration I used earlier, you get up in the morning, yawn, stumble out of bed, start moving around, 
Ah, you've been up an hour, you realize you forgot to make coffee and you're kind of hungry and now you're three hours in and you are going to throw something at someone unless you... Oh, yeah, don't wait any longer. Ah, okay, all better. I can sit still now. Okay. But you can take any circumstance of life and tell that story. So underneath... Any melody that you hear is the explicit rendering of that kind of movement. But that movement is actually subtly present in the melody. So I'll take those three chords, one, four, and five, or in the key of C, C, F, and G. chords a little differently in my left hand and you know we're not this isn't like a music lesson per se so I'm because any of these things we could talk about for a long time but I just those are those sounds the you know the hey I'm here hey I'm moving and I sort of resolve but I'm actually still moving oh my goodness now I'm things because everything's sort of a starting place but you see what I did I stayed within the notes of the C scale and I moved around even even more there All right uh, but can you hear that movement now if things a little bit. I made the tension come a little bit earlier. It's all real subtle, but it just keeps you moving forward. So let me go ahead. Uh, actually, this is the wrong paper. No wonder my notes aren't making sense. That was my draft. <laughs> okay, so let's see how much out of order I am. All right, so yeah. So create diatonic harmony harmony from the major scale harmony with chords that occur in the scale that the song is written in uh, but then once you like learn that just like take the idea of like creating little tensions and moving them around and stuff but as involved or not involved whatever as whatever I just did there is just like an extrapolation of where I started uh, and the harmony the chords you use help you tell the story so if you're backing yourself up on guitar right you know you're supporting the story you're telling with the song. Uh, so, let me see here. Okay, historically, chords are an extension of melodies. So the perspective I'm giving you is a perspective, you know, rooted in the evolution of music, particularly, you know, Western culture, right? Uh, and now chords are perceived as things. And what I what I word I already use, rocks, right? You know, you have a C chord, you have an F chord. You have... Yeah and no, no, no. Chord chords are there to support the tension and the release.
so let's give some examples and let's put Twinkle Twinkle Little Star aside. Uh, and let me do one thing, and I apologize for, for standing up. All right. Okay. Uh, let's... I meant to open my hymnal, but that's okay. Hymnal? What am I going to do with the hymnal? Well, nothing right now. I'm going to play a song with those three chords. I can't count. Three, right? Uh, in fact, when you learn one, four, five chord in music, back when I was coming up, you know, 70-ish is, the big sort of example was, you know, play your cheating heart. See, there's my secret. I'm sitting there. Sort of, sort of arc, right? Uh, now, let me show you in another context. And I'm opening a hymnal because hymnals are like these chorale pieces. Uh, and now I don't remember. This is this is awful. Uh, no, it's not awful. It's ridiculous. Is what it is. I didn't write down the number. So, here is a hymn from a hymnal that is taken from uh, a Bach aria right? and a little piece of it is made into a hymn tune and these hymn tunes have typically one word titles this one is faithful from the aria my heart ever faithful appropriately but what would you think if I told you that this little uh, classical piece uses the same three chords exclusively as your cheating heart at least the a section I played <laughs> right C F and G that's it and that's your most basic harmony. The harmony of, or, or the, the function of being passive, the function of transitioning or moving, the function of being, getting to the point of highest tension, where you resolve it to again being passive. So the resolution of the tension is that point of being passive. The same chord, the one chord. If you only have three choices, you're gonna resolve that five chord, the chord of highest tension, ooh, to the one. And, and that sort of like ebb and flow, the tie goes in, the th not the tie, but the, you know, the waves come in, the waves go out kind of thing, just brushing over you all the time, is, is, is underlying all of music. So let's say that I had a student uh, playing this piece. And I don't do nearly the amount of teaching I did many years ago. And back then, lots of beginners did the neighborhood piano teacher-ish kind of thing, you know, way, way, way back. So that basic tension and release that I'm playing uh, also supports like little little micro tension and releases that can happen like when i reharmonize twinkle twinkle a little bit 
you know, you, you can dig deeper. This is the very basic thing. So how I would encourage students to think about interpreting, to think about expressing, because that's what this music is, is now pretend this is a piece that doesn't have words here, right? And it's just a little instrumental thing and it goes. <laughs> Plays like that, say. You know, it sounds. Yeah, you know, sounds like that, maybe. Uh, so, what I would do is I would have them play it. And I have them physically write in their music a story that they're going to make up that they believe, that they feel that the music supports. You know, I got up one morning, I mean, not lyrics to a melody, just like. Uh, a story, not that the melody could be like a soundtrack behind, you know, kind of thing. I got up one morning, I I I, I got out of the bed and I got got dressed and then I brushed my teeth, I swished my mouth, I spit it out, and I felt better. Okay, that was ridiculous, and that obviously I didn't think that ahead of time, it just came out of my mouth. And to my students' credit, they all did stuff better than I just did, all right? But the melody, and then what the melody implies, which is the harmony, and then the harmony uh, allows you to become more explicit and find other places and then what that does is that now propels and that can propel a story and when you're listening to music you're not necessarily telling yourself a story you're probably not uh, you're listening to lyrics tell you a story that's definitely related but this is external to that as as, as well and and you're being you're being moved by that but to impose a story on it allows you to manage it as a story. And whatever story, you know, this one student might write in their piece of music. If I had another one that had a, the same piece of music, they'd write a totally different story. The, the story itself is much less important than the arc and flow of the story, which is what gets communicated, which is why music speaks to all of us individually and uniquely and i uh, i'm sure that makes sense so let me just improvise a little bit on this little piece and then as i do uh maybe tell yourself a story maybe actually think of like if i were to write the little count oh i i I see my cat walking across you know the 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 the, the room and play with a ball of yarn or whatever See if something happens. could have given you something to work from but if it wasn't working for you to actually try to tell yourself a story uh, hopefully you were just being moved along by the story the direction that this music was taking you and now a little, little parentheses because I, I think I can say something and make this make this make sense uh, that my view of everything, you hear me say this all the time about, about my process, that I only have a wide angle lens uh, and 
that's a double-edged sword. But the positive end of that is that I'm always seeing the context, the big picture. And if you're seeing the big picture, then you're always aware of how you're moving across the picture, right? So you're seeing yourself not just in one little confined space of where you are, okay? You are allowing yourself to see the arc of where it came from and where it's going. And now I'm going to be way off my notes, but I think this will make sense. And uh, I do allow myself to say things I've said before. Probably not everyone has watched every one of these you know, videos, particularly the former series. Maybe some of you have, and it will just allow me to repeat myself a little bit. But one of the uh, really important things that one of my classical teachers said to me, and this was my, my first real classical teacher who uh, I was with for just a few months, uh, maybe six months or so, uh, to prepare for my college audition uh, when I realized I was going to be a piano major in college. Uh, or at least at the time I was I was thinking that because I didn't know what else to do. And uh, she got my classical chops up. Uh, but she also knew what I did. And be, being a good teacher, even though she was not an improviser or a jazz player, she could give me musical concepts. And one of those concepts was that when you're improvising a line, uh, just like in a classical piece, the the, the phrases are typically long. They're not just, you know, three notes, you know, C spot run, C dick chase spot, you know, whatever. They're like, each sentence kind of tells its own story. So, so the kind of crux of this is the mature phrases are the long phrases, right? Not, not the two or three word sentences. That's what a toddler speaks when they, you know, when they learn how to communicate. But eventually we all learn to like, if not tell little stories in our sentences, have sentences that have an arc and create context uh, and connect to the rest of the story. So, you know, when, you, when you're hearing a story told or when you're reading a novel or, or, or something, everything just flows into the next and you're not thinking about, uh, okay, what was that word? And what was that word? And what was that word? You're not hearing words, right? In, 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 in a well-delivered story or well-written story. You are, you are taking in the story, right? And the idea of chords, and this is so important for beginner musicians uh, to understand. Okay? Guitar players, piano players, whatever. The... The chord you're playing, the note you're playing, has one purpose. To connect you to the next thing, or the thing before it, that begins to create a context. And ultimately, the mature playing goes across. So when Mary Hinkle told me that a mature phrase is a longer phrase, Implied in that is if you're thinking about chords and you see how I move chords around underneath what I'm playing in the right hand, uh, whether it's right, that means the mature phrase is actually going to cover multiple chords or a, a, a harmonic sequence, a harmonic progression, right? Uh, which means you're going to feel that movement of you know, traveling and tension and release and possibly happening multiple times, little micro versions and then one big version and all of that uh, happening within one phrase of music, right? Uh, so let's say, and it's very possible that some of you who are watching this uh, are students of jazz, right? And Boy, is jazz taught from a particular perspective 
uh, today, an academic perspective, that's not really where, where, where jazz came from. And improvisation in, in the pure sense is more than uh, like, playing a chord and then learning what scale you can play over the chord. And then every other chord you play, you play a different scale o over that chord. Uh, I mean, true, I don't think that way, but true. Uh, but what it really is, is looking over the chords. So to be able, let's go back to your cheating heart. I forgot to set something up and that was in my mind. So I'm going to go ahead and play your cheating heart and I'm going to allow the, the, the harmony now to be, you know, a little more involved because I demonstrated where it comes from, the one, four, five. And now you're going to, you know, see me play notes that aren't in the, I play the key of C, I guess I am, that aren't in the C scale. All right. Uh, but but now, now you're just going to hear be sort of extrapolate the tension release and when you see chords move around you're going to see me play a line that crosses over different chords okay and now you're really just doing the the, the bob and weave and you know move a story through kind of thing hopefully that made sense so let me just just improvise on your on your cheating heart a little bit
right, I guess I needed to get some of that out of my system. Uh, a little bit of moving around for cheating hard. So, uh, let's go back now from the just esoterically conceptual to what concretely I hip you to, especially if you're not a musician and you haven't heard this before. One, four, five, three chords. And what I'll tell students, and I don't know if this was ever actually said to me quite like this, uh, you know, from, from somebody teaching me, but uh, it's really the case that chords only do one of those three things. They either rest, they transition, or they are a chord of highest tension that demands that you resolve it somewhere. And that's the function of the one, four, five chord. You know, passive, transitional, active, resolving the passive. So those are the only three kinds of chords that exist. No matter how fancy your chord gets, you can learn all the fancy pants chords you want. They're only going to do one of three things. They're going to set you down, or they're going to you know, allow you to, to move forward, to you know, figure out where you're going, or see where it takes you. And then, then they're going to require you to sit down again you know, for that highest tension release uh, kind of thing. So hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, so I will hip you to the idea that the other chords that occur in the scale because I said there's one, four, five and I left out two and three and six and seven, right? Uh, they can come into play and they can begin to enhance and, and uh, make sort of nicer uh, the movement of one, four, five. So instead of like just one, four, five you can get the others, three, six, two, five, one. You can use like a bunch of them. And then you can create more tensions by like, you know, going off the reservation. And there's that sort of tension release. So I will show you one progression where we're going to take one of the chords that kind of functions as a transitional chord, but it can also function as a resolution chord, the sixth chord. And uh, instead of just playing one, four, five, we'll play one, six. thousand nine hundred and twenty two million songs so what did I do I added another transitioning chord in there right to that song. It, it, it keeps going. But everybody knows that A section of, of Heart and Soul. And if you played Heart and Soul, you're playing, if you're in C, which you probably are, C, A minor, F, B minor. If you want to get B minor, F, G. C, A minor, I got D minor on the brain, is my problem. C, A minor, F, T. And why do I have D minor on the brain? Uh, it needs to be drained. I need a D minor drain. Uh, is because 
uh, in the, the jazz Great American Songbook sense, that four chord kind of gives way to the two chord. So you have one, six, two. Okay. And so like one, four, one, four, five is like defines kind of basic folk country music. Right. Uh, one, six, four, five is kind of like your 50s rock. Six two five one, right? Uh, and then the two five one becomes like the the micromanaged thing that jazz took a hold of. So now I'm playing a D minor and a G, like as I'm going to resolve the C. Here, like the, the ebb and flow, but never really resolves because it actually goes to another two five. It still doesn't resolve, it goes to another two five, it goes to another two five, and then finally resolves. And you're like, Phew, take me off this roller coaster, man. Uh, no, you don't actually say that because you enjoy the ride. You know, uh, Satin Doll was a popular tune in, I think, the, the, the 50s, and you know, those old enough to remember it, you know, remember, remember it fondly because it. It takes you someplace. Now, the theory behind that is like several extrapolations beyond just using one, four, five in your cheating heart. And I'm not, you know, <coughs> showing you this, you know, this is the kind of thing you would study for a long time and practice and, and get used to. But I mean, it's my job, so I don't know what I'm doing to some extent. So now maybe you have a sense of being pulled along by the melody, but also by the harmony and seeing that the harmony creates sentence structure, right? And it creates a context. And then you can look over that landscape, right? And you can play off that context and you can say all sorts of things. So now,
say it, although I shouldn't. If I were doing these as like real edited videos, because well, I just have to take whatever I get and I just upload it from my phone and to, to, to YouTube intact, in I would edit that out. Uh, that didn't, didn't quite get there. But I think you got the idea still. Uh, so I think I'm going to play one more tune here. Uh, and I'm not going to play it with uh, the tension drawn on the particular chords I'm playing. I'm just going to play a, a wonderful Gershwin uh, standard, Someone to Watch Over Me, with the verse. And just have an attentive ear to you know, that ebb and flow. Those little micro tensions and releases of things that, that propel you along and, you know, make the music applicable and reflective of your life experiences because your life experiences do the same thing as the music does. Okay, so let me, let me draw attention to the, the verse though. <laughs> you want to stop because I just set up keeping going and if you play the verse of a song it's to set up the song so it's going to end with this setup with a five chord oh there it is right so I'm going to start again I'm going to play the verse again I'm going to try to be focused I'm not entirely focused right now but that's okay. And the verse will be what we call rubato, out of time. And then the uh, tune itself will be in time. And the time then can effectively deliver the ebb and flow, right? <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, that landscape, <laughs> that was kind of like a plane going across the landscape, having a bird strike, slapping the land in the river. Ah, but it's okay, you know, everyone got, everyone got out alive. You know, while I'm playing that, you know what was distracting me? And you probably like heard me hint at it because I wasn't sure what to do with it. And I wanted to make it go away like I need the fly swatter. Shine on Harvest Moon kept showing up, you know, I have to go. Mm -hmm. oh, here it is. So, uh, like, welcome to my brain, welcome to my inner workings, where Shine on Harvest Moon is like, you know, like like, like a seagull flying in front of my little Cessna, right? Uh, it's supposed to be someone to watch over me. I don't know. But anyway, hope it's interesting to see into my world or, or whatever. Thanks so much for watching. We'll do this again. Maybe I'll see you tomorrow night for Piano for My Friends. Oh boy, I think I need lunch. See ya.